I want to begin with uh, a question this morning. Um, maybe get your brains thinking a little bit, but, but this question is, is, has to do with, with maybe something you've experienced, but have you ever felt overlooked or excluded from something? Have you ever felt, oh, let me see this hands. have you ever felt overlooked or excluded? All right, it, it might have been left off a team or picked last for the team. It, you may have felt like in my audition, I got overlooked. Uh, I didn't get the part or the chair that I thought I deserved. Or maybe you felt forgotten by someone, right? That maybe you're, a group of friends didn't include you. Or you just feel like, you know, I'm not invited. I don't fit in. I don't belong. If you've ever felt that way, I want you to know, first of all, that you're not alone. But today, as we continue our journey of, of thinking about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. When, when Jesus came to this earth and he began his public ministry, there was a group of people that had presumptions about who qualified, who deserved to have a relationship with God. Right? They, they had in their mind that there were certain people who deserved a relationship with God. and They were a, a sect or division of the Jews called the Pharisees, I'm sure, that you have heard about the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were a group that took the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, very, very seriously. And they took their, their beliefs about God very seriously. And that, that was a good thing. But in the midst of those strongly held beliefs, they had come to believe that there were people who deserved a relationship with God, and there were people who didn't. And of course, they were among those who what? Did deserve it. They felt, we might say, entitled, right? Have you ever felt entitled? Here's what entitled means. It means believing oneself to be inherently deserving of privileges or special treatment. All right, so just want to be honest for a moment this morning, right? Can we do that? All right. Have you ever felt entitled? All right. Okay. Uh, the honesty is slowly growing, right? All right, maybe, maybe let me make this a little bit easier. How many of you ever known or met someone who felt entitled? All right, that's an easier question. All right, when you're entitled, you, again, you think, I deserve something, right? I deserve special privileges, special treatment. The, the, the rules don't ap apply to me. And when Jesus began inviting people to follow him, it really confronted the Pharisees' notion of what they expected or thought God would do or even the Messiah would do. Because Jesus invited people who were on the margins of society. The people that were overlooked. The people that were unwanted. The people that were unloved. The people that we might even say were untouchable. Right? He invited, he invited people with problems, with issues, with baggage. And we're going to see today that he even invited those that were traitors to their own nation and to their own people. And we're going to look at what does that mean for me, and what does that mean for you as we seek to follow Jesus. So if you have your Bible today, I want to invite you to turn, uh, to, we're going to be in Luke chapter 5. Uh, but in order to, in order to set up uh, the scene in, in Luke chapter 5 that we're going to be in today, and we were in Luke chapter 5 on Monday as well, but just going back to, to chapter 4 for a moment, and, and you, can, you can look at chapter 4 if you will, I'm just going to summarize some things. In Luke chapter 4, right, Jesus is ministering in, in, in his hometown in, in Nazareth, and he, he stands up in the synagogue, and he quotes from, from, the, from Isaiah as he reads the scroll in the synagogue, and, and he talks about how those scriptures in Isaiah were pointing to himself. And as he began to do that, there began to be a buzz in the crowd, and they said, you know, we really like the things that Jesus says, and we've been amazed at Jesus' ministry. But this is Joseph's son. Like, we know who Jesus is. Right? They, they thought they knew who he was, and, and, and now he's making some wild and radical claims. And, and because of that, they began to, to have questions. And then Jesus, as he's talking to them and realizing their skepticism, right? We talked about that yesterday. He, he begins to point out some of their inherent prejudices, right? He begins to, he begins to pry at their heart and he, he reminds them that Elijah, right? Elijah the prophet, that he went to the home of a foreign widow and not a Jewish one. And they didn't like hearing that. And then he highlighted the fact that one time there was a man named Naaman. You guys remember Naaman? 
right? And Naaman was from Syria, right? And the Jews and the Syrians don't like each other, even to this day. And so he said, you know, in that day, there were many Jewish people who had leprosy, and none of them were healed, only Naaman, the Syrian. And at this point, right, as he's doing these things, the Jews became so angry at Jesus. They were so enraged at what they were hearing that they tried to kill Jesus. Look at verse 28 and 29 in chapter 4, or actually through 30. He says, all of the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. And they got up and they drove him out of the town. And they took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. Right? And so in a, in a, in a mob action that would actually violate their own laws and their own rules, they, you know, because it's interesting, when, when the people who are the rule keepers that want to enforce the rules for everyone, often they don't enforce it for who? Themselves. And so they... They, they do this, but I love what happens in verse 30. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Right? You know, here's this angry mob, I mean, who physically, obviously could have overtaken Jesus, and they're, they, they take him out to the edge of the hill, and they want to throw him off the cliff, and then Jesus just says, pardon me, excuse me, right? I, I have to go, right? And he just walks through the crowd, and he leaves. And so we don't know exactly what happened, but he used, obviously, his supernatural power because it was not his time. Right? It was not his time. Then Jesus is going to cast a demon out of a demon-possessed man. And in this day, demon-possessed people were very much on the margins of society. Right? They, they, they were obviously seen as have done something to deserve their demon possession. But Jesus cast the demon out, and this man becomes a follower of Jesus. Then he healed Peter's mother-in-law. And she was a woman. And women in this society were looked down on. They were in the margins. And so Jesus ministered and touched people in the margins of society. Then he healed a leper. And you want to talk about the ultimate outcast? Right? There, was no way to be, uh, there was no way to be more of an outcast than to be a leper. You, you were untouchable, literally. And Jesus touched the leper and healed him. And lepers really ultimately all serve as a function of a, a picture of all of us because we've all been infected by sin. Then he healed a paralyzed man in front of a huge crowd. And not only did he do that, but he proclaimed that his sins were forgiven. And so many people were skeptical about Jesus. And we said yesterday, we understand skepticism. And skepticism can be good. It can be healthy. But we also have to allow truth to overcome our skepticism. Right? Because sometimes, believe it or not, we are wrong, right? I know it's shocking, right? right? I see some shock, right? Sometimes we are wrong. And when truth confronts that reality, we need to allow truth to speak to that. And so Jesus had a ministry to the excluded, to the marginalized, to the overlooked, to the forgotten. And to those people, his message resonated so deeply. Because they were people who may have thought, I'll never belong. I'll never be accepted. God would never want me. And maybe you can identify with those feelings. Feeling like you don't qualify. Feeling like you're not good enough. Feeling like you've been forgotten or overlooked. And so as we look at this story today, in Luke chapter 5, we're going to be in verse 27 through 32. I want you to, to listen in and to lean into what God might be speaking to you today. So let's begin I believe we'll find some incredible hope in this story. Luke chapter 5, uh, verses 27 and 28. It says, After this, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. And so leaving everything behind, he got up and began to follow him. And so once again, we find Jesus extending this simple two-word invitation. Follow me. And Jesus, as a rabbi, as a teacher, was gathering those that he would be around. But it would, Jesus really took the opposite route of the norm of the custom. In the custom of the day, a student or one who wanted to be learning from a rabbi would approach that rabbi and they would ask to be a follower. But Jesus flipped that around and he invited people to follow him. But now, Jesus is inviting this man named Levi who is sitting at the tax office. Now, 
Many of you might be familiar with the backstory, but just to bring us all up to speed, what would happen in this day and this custom is the Romans would contract with Jewish people to collect the taxes for Rome. And so you can imagine tax collectors would not be very popular for this because the Jewish people saw the Romans as they were invaders, they were occupiers, they were ones who were controlling them, they were, they were basically enslaved to them, if you will, right? They, they were under their authority, their laws, their rules. And they were waiting for that to end. But these Jews, their fellow brothers, would sell out to Rome because they were given permission to collect as much as they could get and they were paid by what they over collected. And so tax collectors would become very wealthy. And tax collectors were not liked. They were outcasts. Because once they made that decision, right, once they made that decision, they became outcasts to their families. Their families would often disown them. They were disqualified from being a judge or a witness. And they were excommunicated from the synagogues. Right? A tax collector was not welcome at church, if you will. Are you with me? Right? Synagogue is where the Jews would gather to worship. So we can make that correlation, right? They were excommunicated. They were kicked out. In the eyes of the community, they were disgraced and they were left out. But to Levi's shock, I'm sure, Jesus approaches his tax booth. And, and again, once again, I, I, know, I know there's a lot of fatigue and tired that's setting in. How many of you say, I'm, I'm feeling tired? All right, anybody? Raise your hand. All right, I know, I am too. So I want you to use your imagination to help wake you up a little bit. Let's put ourselves in Matthew's sandals. And Matthew probably had really, really nice sandals, right? Because he's really what? He's rich because he's done a lot of what? Stealing, right? He's done a lot of taxing and stealing, right? So Matthew has really, really nice sandals, designer sandals. And I'm, I'm no fashion expert, so I don't know what brand he had. But I imagine he had really, really nice sandals. And so let's put ourselves in those really nice, comfortable, high-end sandals. Are you with me? Are you awake? All right. And here's Matthew. He's sitting in his tax collecting booth where people have to come and, and, and pay their taxes. And no doubt Matthew has heard Jesus, right? Everyone in the region has heard of him by now. I'm sure he's listened in to some of his messages. And we can presume by his response that something had been stirring in Matthew's heart. Something in his heart had resonated with the message of Jesus, but I imagine he thought, there's no way that Jesus would ever invite me. There's no way that Jesus would ever want me because I am a traitor. I'm a thief. I'm an outcast. I'm excluded. I'm excommunicated. And I imagine that day as he's there and he sees Jesus approaching, that his heart rate began to what? That began to increase, right? I began, I imagine as Jesus came, it, it began to be, what is Jesus going to say? Is Jesus coming to rebuke me? Is Jesus coming to tell me what an awful person I am? Is Jesus coming to tell me what a terrible thief I am? Is Jesus coming to tell me I'm going to hell? I mean, what is Jesus coming to say? And Jesus approaches his tax booth. And instead of any of that, he simply looks at Matthew or Levi and he says, Follow me. And I imagine there was kindness and warmth in Jesus' eyes. And so Matthew now has a decision to make. Am I going to stay here in my tax booth? Am I going to continue? You know, yes, I'm an outcast, but I'm a really rich outcast. I have really nice sandals, remember? And I live in a really nice home. And, and you know, this is a weird life but I have a sort of camaraderie with other outcasts and other people that are kicked out. And, and, and so Matthew has to make a decision. And Matthew makes the decision. It says, leaving everything behind, he got up and began to follow him. Matthew jumped at this opportunity, but it required leaving everything, his old ways, his income, his status, as weird as it was. And he began to follow Jesus. And I know that Matthew knew that he did not deserve this honor. But really, that's the point, because no one does. Right? You see, the Pharisees had a problem in their thinking, because they thought they somehow had earned or deserved God and his love and a relationship with him. 
but no one can and no one did. And so he invites Matthew, and Matthew decides that this occasion, Jesus inviting him to follow him, leaving his old life to follow Jesus, the best thing to do would be what? Party. Party, absolutely. Right, he says the best thing we can do is have a party. And so that's exactly what he does. Look at verse 30. Or, I, I'm sorry, verse 29. I got ahead of myself. Then Levi hosted a grand banquet. Translation, huge party. Are you with me? For him, for Jesus at his house. He threw a party for Jesus. And guess who he invited? All of his friends, right? All the outcasts, the tax collectors, and others who were outcasts, no doubt. It says there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others who were guests with them, and so he invites them, and Jesus joins them for this party. He isn't put off by them. He's not embarrassed by them. He's not ashamed to be there. He's not ashamed to enter their world. And the Pharisees and the religious leaders could not stand it. Look at verse 30. It says, but the Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Right, guys, why are you, you know, why are you doing this? And notice that they, you know, Jesus is right there, but they, they ask his followers, not him. They were sort of cowardly, I think. They said, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus listening in, he, he says, guys, let me answer this. The healthy don't need a doctor, but the sick do. And I have not call, come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see, they had categories, the Pharisees, of who was in and who was out. Who deserved God's love and who didn't. And Jesus' response to them wasn't that they didn't need him, but that they did not recognize their need of him. And he said, I've come for everyone, but I've come for those who recognize their need of me. You see, Jesus came for all, but not everyone recognized their need. Pride sometimes obscures our, our, our realization that we need God. And pride is one, something that pushes God away. And even though these Pharisees knew the word of God, right? It, it's not enough to just know about God or have information about God. Even though they knew that, that pride had overtaken their hearts and their lives. And pride always pushes God away. The Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And in John chapter 1, as John was writing his gospel, he, he acknowledged the reality that although Jesus had come, God had appeared in human flesh. The Word became flesh, John would say, and, and dwelt among us. And he said, even though that happened, some refused to see. Look at verse 10 in John chapter 1. He said, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, but the world did not recognize him. Verse 11, he came to that which he, was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. I mean, notice what he says. He gave the right to become children of God. And so Jesus, when he arrived and began to proclaim the kingdom of God, he began to proclaim his rule and his reign, and that he had come to invite anyone and everyone who is willing to come into his kingdom. And that Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, was not just here to save the Jewish people, the physical descendants of Abraham, but he had come for everyone because God had made a promise to Abraham that through you, what all the families of the earth, all the nations would be blessed. And so it was always God's plan all along to redeem for himself a people of every tribe, tongue, and nation. Right? And we get, if you, if you read in Revelation, as John's given a vision into heaven and even into the future, right? we know that one day what God has ordained and planned will happen. Right? That people of every tribe, tongue, and nation, of every language will be gathered around God's throne and we will know Him and worship Him forever and ever. And so today, I, I want you to know as we consider, what, what about me? Right? Maybe you say, I feel overlooked or I feel excluded. Or I feel like Jesus wouldn't want me because of what I have done or what I'm doing right now. Or it could be you say, I've always actually kind of felt entitled. I feel like I've deserved God's love. And neither are true. But here's what I want you to know. That no matter your past or no matter your present, 
or your problems, you can be a follower of Jesus. Right? Being a follower of Jesus is for anyone and everyone who would come to him and choose to follow him. Right? He invite, now, we could not come to him if he did not come to us. Right? We would not come to him if God had not initiated the relationship. Right? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Right? He is the author and finisher of our faith. Right? And so we would not even be able to make that choice if God did not enable or allow that to happen. But anyone and everyone can be a follower of Jesus. I want to give you three things this morning as we think about the call of God on our life. Number one, the wayward are welcome. The wayward are welcome. You know, Matthew was a very wayward man. Right? He had, he had, he had made a terrible choice to betray his own people and to become an IRS agent of Rome. Right? Are you with me? And not only that, but to do that in a way where he stole from his own people. And one of the interesting things as we study where, where Matthew worked in Galilee is that one of the, you know, the, the fishermen there were, were, were taxed, right? Everybody was taxed. And so it's quite possible that even, even Peter and Andrew and James and John had had to pay taxes to Matthew, right? Isn't it ironic, right, that, that, that as Jesus is gathering himself a group of people, that one of them probably stole from the others? But God forgives sin. And when God forgives sin, not only does it make us right with him, but it allows the relationship with each other, right, to be healed and to be restored. My, my childhood pastor uh, recently passed away, and I was listening to one of his messages where he told his testimony and his story. And he grew up in a, in a, in a very, very, very difficult home in Bridgeton, New Jersey. His father was an alcoholic, and he was never really around. He became an alcoholic himself. He was uh, heavy into gambling, and God saved him at the age of 24 and set him free and changed him. But because of his gambling problem, he had a problem with stealing. He would steal from his work, and then he would cover it up when they did an audit. This was before computers, right? And so he would go to a loan shark and get money, and then he would pay, you know, fix the books, and then when the audit was over, he'd take the money back out and pay off the loan shark. In fact, he said after he became a follower of Christ, he had to take a loan out from the bank to pay off all the things that he had stolen. But he said eight months after he came to know Christ, his church made him the treasurer. Isn't that amazing? The person who used to steal, right, was now entrusted with people's donations. Why? Because God changed him. He made him an honest person. And you see, the wayward are welcome. Right? God took a wayward person like him, who was not a good husband, who was an addiction, had a massive addiction to gambling to the point of stealing, an addiction to alcohol. And he got, God took him, saved him, called him, used him in my life and in thousands of others. And God delights in taking the wayward. And so listen, your past, right, your issues, your failures are not a problem. You're invited to come. Right? Jesus called the sick. He called Gentiles. He called adulterers. He called cheaters and foul-mouthed fishermen. And he invited them. And so I just want you to know there's nothing in your past that would prohibit you from following Jesus. Nothing. Because the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. And so if you feel like you're wayward, I want you to know that you're welcome. And if you have become entitled, and maybe as a, even as a follower of Jesus, you start to think that, that, there are, that only certain people deserve God's love. Or, or only people who look like me or from places like me deserve God's love. If you think there are categories of people Right? Remember that God has called us to reach into the margins, to those who are overlooked, to those who are forgotten, to those who are broken, and to share with them the same hope that God has given us. Number two, not only are the wayward welcome, but your past and your present don't prohibit you. Right? Matthew had a past and a present. He was still in the tax booth when Jesus called him. Right? You don't have to clean up your life. You don't have to fix your life in order for Jesus to call you. He'll clean you up. He'll fix it. But you just come. He was a traitor and a thief, excluded from the temple. But Jesus invited him. You know, I struggled with my call as, as a pastor because I knew that my past, I didn't think I had deserved, I didn't live the kind of life growing up that I thought a pastor should live. I didn't think I deserved, I, didn't, I thought I was unqualified and guess what? I was right. 
Believe it or not, it doesn't happen often. But I was right. I wasn't qualified, and I didn't deserve it, but that's not why Jesus called me. Right? He calls us simply because of His grace and His choice and His purposes. And He doesn't call us because we're deserving. He calls us because He is worthy and He is deserving. And He delights in taking people and transforming them. He delights in taking the foolish things of the world and using them in extraordinary ways. Right? And I take great comfort in that verse. Anybody else with me? And so I want you to know that, that if Jesus is calling you, it doesn't matter about your past. And it doesn't matter about your problems and your issues and your struggles, right? He's not afraid to touch that place in your life. He's not afraid to accept you and to forgive you. And so I want to invite you to come to him. And number three, though, repentance is required. While your past and your present are not a problem, notice that Matthew had to leave everything. He could not follow Jesus and continue to be a tax collector and steal from people, right? He had to leave that life. And so, yes, our past and our present is not a problem. But at the same time, we cannot hold on to our sin. We cannot hold on to our habits that are displeasing to God and fully pursue and follow Him. Matthew left his life of being a traitor. He left it all. He threw a party and celebrated. And he invited his friends because I think he wanted his tax collector friends to say, you know what, I want you too to hear about Jesus and I want you to know that you too can be set free from, yes, a life that you thought would be good. And, you know, having the best sandals might seem really amazing, but it's really empty. Because we weren't made just to satisfy ourselves or to accumulate stuff. Right? We were made in God's image. We were made to know Him. We were made to serve Him. We were made to live for His glory. And so Matthew knew that there was something more. And so he threw a party and invited his friends. So I just want you to know that your past and your present is not a problem, but repentance is required. Repentance means to stop, to recognize, to ask God's forgiveness, and then by His grace and through the Holy Spirit power to go a different direction. You know, when I was here at camp, God convicted me about ways that I acted in my school, ways that I talked, ways that I treated people, and God convicted me of those things. And I realized that I had to repent, that I had to acknowledge that that was sinful, and that I had to ask Him for grace to live differently. And by His grace, I began to. Not perfectly, none of us do, but I began to have a new passion and a new desire. And so maybe, maybe today, God might be convicting you of something in your life. An area of rebellion that you're holding on to, a habit, something that you know is not pleasing to Him, not honoring to Him, goes against His Word. And it might be that God has brought you here this morning. Right? I know you had to be here. But I believe God knew we'd all be here. And maybe he's wanting to convict you of that. And listen, Jesus is not wanting to convict you of that so you'll just feel bad. He wants you to, to let it go. He wants to forgive you. He wants you to know his forgiveness and his mercy and his grace. He wants you to be free from that. He wants you to be free from the shame and the regret. He wants you to know the joy and the peace that comes from forgiveness and following him. And so I just want to ask you to really ponder this question. Am I following Jesus? Am I really and truly following Jesus? When I came here as a, as a student, I was saved. I was born again. I belonged to God. I was a child of God. But I was not following Him. And I became convicted of that. And God changed the trajectory of my life. And I'm praying today that God might do that for you. And that you might realize the beauty and the joy and the privilege of following Christ. And I want you to know that no matter what, no matter your past, no matter your problems, right, Jesus is willing to accept you, to receive you, to forgive you. And whether it's coming to him for the first time for salvation, to say, maybe I've, I've ne I never have answered the call to be born again, to be saved, to be forgiven of my sin, to know God personally. And maybe today, today's the day you say, you know what, I've had doubts and I've had questions and I'm not sure, but I know in my heart that God's doing something. And I know He's real. And I know, he, I know He's pursuing me. And today's the day for you to say yes to Him. To say, God, I don't understand everything, but I recognize my sinfulness. And I believe that your son Jesus lived. I believe He died. I believe He rose from the dead. I believe I want to know you and I want to know your love and your grace and your mercy. 
And I want to live for you. And maybe that would be you today. And if that's you today, I just want you to tell God that from your heart to his. And he will save you, adopt you, redeem you, forgive you, and make you his forever. Many of you have known that experience. right? You know Jesus. You've been born again. But maybe you'd say, you know what? I've got some shame that I'm carrying because there's some secrets in my life. There's some ways that I'm not really following Jesus. And today God's calling you to confess that to him. And bring that to him. He's waiting and ready to forgive you. And he's inviting you to something different, to something better. A life of following him, serving him, and living for his glory. And I want to invite you to have the courage. And if you need to talk to someone, talk to your counselor. Come find me, your faculty members. We'd love to help you walk through that. There's no shame in coming clean. Right? Because Jesus removes shame. And he removes sin. And he sets us free. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you for giving us a new day. Father, I know many of us are feeling the effects of tiredness or even fighting off some sickness. And so, Father, I just pray for everyone here today. I pray that you would fill them with supernatural strength, that you give them energy for the tasks ahead. I pray that today, uh, despite the challenges that we face, would be a day of learning and growth. Father, a day of joy, of experiencing music together, of learning together, of growing together. But Father, I pray right now that, that beyond all of that, Father, if there's, if there's someone here today that does not know you, that in this moment you would make yourself known to them and bring them to yourself, that they might know the joy of salvation, that they might know the freedom of salvation. And Father, I pray for all of us that we might consider carefully the question of whether we're really following you. Father, I thank you that the wayward are welcome. I thank you that you love outcasts and the overlooked. You love the marginalized and the forgotten. And you invite them, us, into your kingdom, into your family, where we are fully accepted, where we fully belong, where we are fully yours. And Father, I pray that knowing that amazing truth would cause us to trust you, that we might follow you. And Father, if there's areas that we need to repent of, to confess, may we be quick to do that. May we experience your forgiveness. And then may we in faith, choose to follow. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.